By golly, it's amazing. It sounds like something you'd hear on the radio. Presenting the transcription feature... The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. It's half past eight New York time. Time to wake up America and stump the expert. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. (laughs) And now, meet Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. It's the Bill Harris Alice Faye Show, presented transcribed by the makers of Rexall Drug Products. And now it's time to meet the men from the ministry. Forces Radio and Television Service presents the Bob Hope Show with Les Brown and his band of renown, and yours truly, Bill Goodwin. And now here he is, Bob Hope. Greetings. I'm Kevin Lauderdale. It's November, and that means it's Thanksgiving. It's really hard to find non-comedy Thanksgiving material, so usually when I do a Thanksgiving show, I do two comedy episodes. That's what I'll be doing again today. Time to start off the holidays, folks. First up, my favorite, Jack Benny. Talk about pink alligators. Well, pink alligators, pink elephants, these are all cliches of a person who's drunk. These are hallucinations they might have. You'll see this a lot in cartoons. Someone's drunk, and they see pink elephants. There's a whole song in the Disney movie Dumbo where Timothy the Mouse, who's had too much champagne, thinks he sees pink elephants on parade. Bromo seltzer was a hangover, heartburn, indigestion remedy. It's like Alka Seltzer today. Abe Lyman was another popular band leader of the time. A quack medicine treatment of the early 20th century was the transplanting of animal glands into people. It was thought that the animal power would somehow transfer itself and this would renew people's energy and vitality. This episode is from 1939, the first year of what some people called Frank's Giving, a combination of Thanksgiving and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president, because from 1939 to 1941, Thanksgiving was not on the fourth Thursday in November. It was moved to the third week in November in order to give people more time for Christmas shopping in order to boost the Depression-era economy. The official date for Thanksgiving had never really been codified into law. It was just sort of a tradition. So it was moved in 1939, as it happened, from November 30th to the 23rd. FDR had declared that the 1940 Thanksgiving would be a week early in August of 1939, but he hadn't yet said anything about the actual year, 1939, until late October. Then he announced it, and all of a sudden people's calendars were incorrect, this caused all sorts of trouble with sports teams who had to reshuffle things, advertising problems. After much outcry and an official study showing that it hadn't really helped the economy, on October 6th of 1941, Congress passed House Joint Resolution 41, officially designating the last Thursday in November of each year as Thanksgiving Day. There's pop culture references to this all over the place. In the 1942 film Holiday Inn, there's an animated turkey on a calendar moving back and forth between Thursdays. There's a reference to a mash note. Perhaps you've seen Bugs Bunny dressed as a woman, accusing some man of being a masher. Originally it meant to flirt, but it took on more the meaning of a womanizer. So a mash note was not exactly a love letter, but more a written proposition. Um, A little more spicy than if you sent a text, Netflix and chill. From November 19th, 1939, The Jack Benny Show. Spoilers in the title. Jack discovers he has purchased an ostrich for Thanksgiving dinner. J-E-L-L-O! The Jell-O Program, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with It's a Whole New Thing. <laughs> gentlemen, this is the age of research. So, we've been doing a little research on the subject of jello. 
Well, we found out that the best days of the week to serve Jell-O are Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Which is just another way of saying that Jell-O is always, anytime and every time, a perfectly swell dessert. For Jell-O brings you that full, extra-rich flavor. A flavor as fresh and sunny as the real ripe fruit itself. And all six of Jell-O's famous flavors has the same rich goodness. Strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. A grand, satisfying flavor that has made Jell-O America's favorite gelatin dessert. And you like Jell-O's gay, appetizing appearance, too. It's shimmering, jewel-like colors that make it look so inviting. So enjoy some tomorrow. Just be sure to get genuine Jell-O and don't accept any substitutes. Look for those big red letters on the box. They spell Jell-O. It's a whole new thing played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, once again we bring you our master of ceremony. That bubbling personality, that effervescent comedian, that fizz, Jack Benny. Well, thank you, thank you. Uh, hello again, this is Jack Benny, the carbonated kid, talking... And, Don, I like that introduction. It fits me to a T. I am bubbling and effervescent. The fizz, you can have that. <laughs> well, Jack, let me explain. When I called you a fizz, it was really a compliment. I meant you were physical. Mm-hmm. You know, a uh, fizz for short. I understand, Don, perfectly. In other words, if you called me a mug, you'd really mean I was magnificent. Is that it? <laughs> exactly. Well, Don, if you think I fell for that, you're a fathead and that's short for your whole body. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Don, uh, let's not get into a routine because uh, I know how you appreciate a good story. And I heard a gag a few minutes ago that will positively put every one of your tins in motion. Oh, yeah, it's a honey. It's a good one, huh? Well, Virgil, the sound man, told it to me, and you know what a clown he is. Get this, Don. <laughs> Don, I, Don, I haven't even told you the story yet. What are you laughing at? <laughs> is it the one about the nearsighted old maid that buried the midget? No, heaven, <laughs> no, Don. Heavens, not that one. Now, uh, this is a brand new story. Get this. There was a fellow walking down the street, and he was leading a pink alligator on a leash, when all of a sudden it started to act up and snap at him. Uh-huh. So the guy got annoyed, turned around to this pink alligator, and said, you better behave yourself, or I'll take a bromo seltzer, and that'll be the end of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, isn't that terrific, Don? <laughs> oh, it sure is. That Virgil has a great sense of humor. Yes, gee, that was a funny story, Mr. Benny. Oh, Dennis, I didn't see it. Did you like it? Yeah. But there's one thing that puzzles me. What? If the man was walking down the street, where did he get the bromo seltzer? Well, I don't know. He probably had a box of it in his pocket. Oh. Then I guess he had a glass of water in his other pocket. Yes, Dennis, and a banjo on his knee. <laughs> now, don't worry about it. Say, you're here kind of early tonight, uh, Dennis. Where's your mother? She's across the street in the bowling alley. In the bowling alley? Well, with her legs, she better watch out. <laughs> anyway, Dennis, I'm glad you're here on time tonight, and I'll try and make a habit of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jack, I can't get over that story you told me. It's silly, but I get a great kick out of it. Isn't it ridiculous? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. What's so funny? Mary, I must tell you. Did you hear the story about the fellow that was walking down the street eating a pink alligator on a leash? Is that the one where the man said, I'll take a bromo seltzer and that'll be the end of you? Yes. No, tell it to me. Well, <laughs> this guy was... Wait, you just told me the answer. I thought you said you never heard it. Oh, stop, Jack. That's one of the oldest jokes in the world. Mary, jokes happen to be my business. And if that was the oldest joke in the world, I'd be the first one to know it. Should I let him have it, folks? <laughs> Never mind. Do me a favor, will you, Mary? Go out and come back in again. Well, gee, Jack, as long as you're telling jokes, why don't you tell a good one? I heard a gag last night that was terrific. Oh, you did, eh? Yeah. A man walked into the house and said to his wife, it's raining cats and dogs outside. Uh-huh. And she said, how do you know? Mm-hmm. And he said, I, I just, just stepped, stepped in, in a poodle. poodle. <laughs> I know where you heard that, Mary, at the Wiltshire Bowl. Bill Harris has been husking that for three years. <laughs> 
That's his theme, Joe. You know, Don, Phil's idea of humor is really pitiful. Oh, I don't know about that, Jack. I was at the bowl one night, and the people screamed at him. Sure they scream at him. Every time he finishes a gag, he has a waiter throw a custard pie in his face. <laughs> That's why. I didn't see anybody do that. Oh, well, you must have been their bucket of water night. <laughs> That's his idea of changing material. <laughs> well, I'll say one thing about Phil. He sure attracts the young collegiate crowd. All the college boys go there. They have to go there, Mary. That's part of their initiation. <laughs> <laughs> Before they can join a fraternity, they have to either listen to Harris or sleep all night in a graveyard. <laughs> In a graveyard? Yes, and you'll be surprised at the number of kids around here that aren't afraid of ghosts. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, Jack, Phil sure believes in that college spirit. Look at that sign on the bass drum. Oh, yeah. Phil Harris and his collegians. Look, he spells collegians with one L. Well, he spells Phil with two, so it's all even. <laughs> you know, Mary, sometimes I think that Phil... Jiggers, here he comes now. Don't jiggers me. <laughs> now, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. What's going on? Well, to tell the truth, Phil, for the last five minutes, we've been talking about you. Well, a little build-up ain't never hurt nobody. No, Phil, and never done you no good, either. <laughs> <laughs> Your grammar's worse than Abe Lyman's, and he never got beyond block. <laughs> Who cares about grammar? I got other things to worry about. Oh, I can imagine. Say, Phil, uh, I noticed that new sign you got on the bass drum. What happened to that corny painting you used to have there? Corny? Yeah, you know, the one with the yellow moon and the green river and the purple trees. Remember that one, Mary? Yeah, he used to call it Gypsy Doodle by Rembrandt. That's the one. <laughs> Whatever happened to that painting, Phil? I sold it to the Metropolitan Museum in New York. You mean the Museum of Fine Art? I don't know what they got there, but that's the joint that bought it. <laughs> Phil, are you crazy? Crazy nothing. Someday that picture will be hanging in Paris, right next to the Mona Lulu. <laughs> well, I'm not going to even bother to correct that. <laughs> How do you like that, Mary? The most famous painting of a woman in the world, and Phil doesn't even know her name. If she were alive, he'd know her name and phone number. <laughs> And her address and what she's doing on Friday night. <laughs> well, I got myself on a detour for no reason at all. And besides... Hey, Jack, why don't you tell Phil that story the sound man told you? He'll get a kick out of it. Oh, he wouldn't even get it. Come on, Jackson, what is it? Let's hear it. All right, Phil. Do you know the one about the fellow who was walking down the street and his pink alligator snapped at him? Know it. I'm the guy that drank the bromo. <laughs> There you are, fellas. He's always got a brilliant comeback, even if he has to make a bum out of himself. <laughs> oh, Dennis. Yes, please? Uh, how about a, how about a song before we get involved again? Okay, Mr. Benny. I'm going to sing an old favorite by Stephen Foster called Jeannie with the Light Brown Hair. Oh, that's swell, Dennis. I, I love those old songs. Old songs, old gags. What this program needs is glands. <laughs> Mary, you just attend to your own little knitting. I'll handle the show. Sing, Dennis. I'm the guy that drank the bromo. <laughs> Oh, 
sweet on smile, radiant with gladness, warm with winning guile. I hear her melodies a tuneful love, warm as a sunlight from heaven above. Other fun notes a merry voice would call, echoed by the birds in the grove, or and all. I sigh for genie with a light brown hair, floating by. with the light brown hair sung by Dennis Day. And Dennis, those old songs always do something to me. I love them. Me too. Genie with the light brown hair. What a grand title. You know, Dennis, uh, I used to have light brown hair. Why, Jack, from the pictures I've seen of you, I thought you had black hair. No, Don, it was brown. Uh, sort of a russet brown. You know, just like the leaves in autumn. Well, rake them up and let's get on with the show. <laughs> Mary, I wish you'd stop with those interruptions. <laughs> anyway, Dennis, uh, Dennis, I noticed another thing. Your singing seems to improve every week. You're gaining poise and confidence. Well, thanks, Mr. Benny. Just think, this is your seventh week on my program. Seven weeks? Gee. Yes, sir. Am I going to get paid pretty soon? <laughs> pretty soon, Dennis. And now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, tonight we are going to... Hey, Jackson, why don't you pay the kid? Bill, I intend to pay him. I'm merely holding his salary until he's a little older. I'm teaching Dennis how to save money. Well, he's learning from the top man. Thanks, Miss Livingston. And if I were you, I wouldn't say another word unless you rub it up on the Lum and Abner program. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, tonight we are going oh, to... Oh, here you are, Dennis. Did you sing your song yet? Yes, Mother. Well, uh, good evening, Mrs. Day. Good evening. Hmm. Oh, Mother, you should have been here a few minutes ago. Mr. Benny told the funniest joke. It was rather good. Tell it to her, Dennis. Well, Mr. Benny was walking down the street leading a pink alligator. Oh, Stude, eh? <laughs> Stude, it wasn't me, Mrs. Day. Dennis got the story all wrong. I never touch a drop of liquor. Then why have you got that red nose? Because I'm a comedian. What do you think? <laughs> My tie lights up, too. This story, Mrs. Day, is about a man who takes a bromo seltzer and gets rid of a pink alligator. What's funny about that? Nothing. It's very sad. I'm crying like anything. <laughs> oh, what a dame. What's that? I said, oh, what a game. I saw UCLA play Santa Clara yesterday. <laughs> it was thrilling. <sighs> <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, if you will please forgive my outburst, as I started to announce, tonight we are going to offer an original little playlet all about Thanksgiving, written especially for the occasion by Mary Livingston. Uh, Mary, let me have it, will you? Oh, Jack, I forgot to tell you. What? I changed my mind about a Thanksgiving play, and I wrote a poem instead. A poem? Hey, Mary, you mean to say we're not going to do a Thanksgiving play? No. Gee, and I was all set to be one of them pilgrims. Oh, fine. You'd make a great pilgrim, Phil. Well, I would. Listen, buddy, my ancestors came over on the Mayflower. Oh, did it dock in Dixie? <laughs> I thought your family always lived in Tennessee. Not originally. You see, we migrated from Massachusetts. <laughs> migrated? You don't by any chance mean you migrated. All right, we move. Forget it. Migratated. Did you hear that, Mary? Yeah, he put in an extra syllable in it. 
You're not paluling. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before we get out of the mood, let me say a few words about Jalello. Jalello? <laughs> it is economical, easy to make, and comes in six delicious flavors. So look for the big red letters on the barrack. Thanks, Don. You surveyed the day. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, as we have no Thanksgiving play... Mary Livingston's going to read a Thanksgiving poem. Oh, no, nothing doing. Oh, gee, it's swell, Jack. I don't care. You're not going to read it. Jack, Benny, you let me read this poem or I won't buy my Christmas card from you this year. (laughs) All right, a lot I make on the ones you get. You don't even have your name printed on them. <laughs> now, go ahead with your poem. Okay. What's the title of it? The title is Thanksgiving. You're a little mixed up, aren't you, kid? <laughs> well, that fits. Go ahead. <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, Thanksgiving. Oh, Thanksgiving. You are with us twice this year. With your pumpkin pie and dressing, and your turkey, front and rear. That's the part I always get. <laughs> the pilgrims planned in days of yore that you'd come once, not any more. But now you are a double feature, and we don't know which day to greet you. Greet you? That's what I said, you gorgeous creature. Now, don't be funny. Go ahead with the poem. Suppose we had two everything, two New Year's Eves to laugh and sing, two Christmases, two Labor Days. And two Jack Bennies with two toupees. <laughs> Mary, you're too, too pressing. Are you through? No, but I'm coming into the stretch. Oh. So Thanksgiving, I don't mind. Well. If you're a week before or a week behind. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference? What the heck? The turkey's the guy that gets it in the neck. The end. Very good. Mary, that was silly, but you came through with flying colors. And now, Phil, how about a number to kind of break things up here? Okay, Jackson, what do you want us to play? Anything special? Well? You name it, and we'll play it. All right, how about that n- number you rehearsed all morning? You know, the only one you can possibly play. Oh, okay. Hit it, boys. He asked for request yet. Hold it a minute, Phil. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? Are you a little mixed up on account of the two Thanksgivings this year? Yes, I am. Why? I was in a fog when we only had one. Goodbye. <laughs> He's not kidding, folks. He's got his shoes on backwards. Play, Phil.
Cherry Berry Bean, a swing version of an old favorite played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. And now, fellas... Hey, before... what's the matter? Aren't you going to complain about the number we just played? No, Phil, I thought it was pretty good. I liked it, didn't you, Mary? Yeah, it was swell. Did you like it, Don? I thought it was okay. How'd you like it, Jack? Oh, it was great. How'd you like Phil's number, Mary? Well, I thought it was a little loud in spots, didn't you, Don? Yes, it seemed a little off here and there. What did you think of it, Jack? I thought it was lousy. <laughs> And now, fellas... Hey, what is this, a rib? Yes, Phil, we were just kidding. I thought your number sounded exceptionally good. Didn't you, Mary? Feel me out. I'm tired. <laughs> now, fellas, as I started to say a little while ago, and before I forget it, uh, Thursday being Thanksgiving, I want all of you to come over to my house for a real old-fashioned turkey dinner. How about it? Oh, well, that's yeah, great, Jack. Yeah. You see, that and was Dennis, so uh, Dennis, this invitation goes for you also. His mother, too? Yes, Mrs. A. My party wouldn't be complete without you. You don't sound very sincere about it. Well, what do you want me to do? Send you a mash note? <laughs> Glad to have you. The more, the merrier. Good heaven. Say, Jack, is this party going to be like the one you gave last Thanksgiving? What do you mean? I mean, is the turkey going to be leg of lamb? Don't worry about that, Mary. This is going to be a real dinner. I've got the biggest, fattest, juiciest turkey you ever saw. Where'd you run over it? <laughs> I didn't run over it. It's a live turkey. I got it in my garage right now. It's roosting on my Maxwell. That's, that's all that car needs. <laughs> now, you wait till you see that, bird. I better weigh 65 pounds. 65 pounds? Why, Jack, you must be mistaken about that. Oh, no, I'm not, Don. I had it on the scale. It's an enormous thing. 65 pounds. Are oh, you kidding? I'm not kidding. Wait till next Thursday and you'll see for yourself. It's going to be a swell party. How many people are you expecting, Jack? Well, there'll be our gang, and then I invited Clark Gable and Carol Lombard, Bob Taylor and Barbara Sandwich, Tyrone Power and Annabella. Oh, Jack, you always ask them to every party you give, and they never show up. Well? Why don't you stop inviting them? I can't stop now. They'll think I'm mad at them. <laughs> you know how it is. How can they be mad at you when they don't even know them? I don't even know them? Listen, Phil, I know every one of those stars personally. Sure, Jack tells them their Christmas cards. Mary, will you stop harping on that? The only reason you ever got cards from me is because I happen to have some left over. Every year. Oh, quiet. <laughs> now, don't forget, fellas, Thursday night at my house. Oh, oh we're going to Jack. Boy, we're going to have a big turkey and cranberry sauce and mashed potatoes. And, Don, guess what kind of jello we're going to have for dessert? Strawberry? No. Raspberry? No. Cherry? No. Orange? No. Lemon? No. Give up? Yes. Lie. <laughs> You see, Don, you almost had it. There's a kindergarten commercial if I ever heard one. <laughs> Never mind, that's what we're going to have. Now look, kids, if I don't see you again before Thanksgiving, be sure and be at my house by 7 o'clock sharp. And don't eat a big lunch so you'll uh, really enjoy the turkey. I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Penny, this is Rochester. All right, what do you want? Well, boss, I just heard you talking about a big Thanksgiving party Thursday night. That's my night off. I'm sorry, Rochester, but you'll have to work. You can take a day off some other time. I can get my twin brother to take my place. I don't want your twin brother. Well, he looks just like me. I don't care if he did. I want you to be at my house on Thursday night. How about me and Spirit and my brother in person? <laughs> Rochester, don't try any tricks. I can tell the difference between you and your twin brother. That more than gal can. <laughs> Never mind. Now, look, Rochester, I want you to get that turkey up to 70 pounds by Thanksgiving to go out in the garage and feed it. I'm working on a Christmas card. They can wait. <laughs> now, go out in the garage and feed the turkey. Okay. Oh, say, boss, I meant to ask you something about that bird. Are you sure it's a turkey? <laughs> what do you mean, am I sure it's a turkey? Well, I went out in the garage a few minutes ago and she laid an egg as big as a cantaloupe. <laughs> As big as a cantaloupe? What are you talking about? Not only that, but every time I go in there, she sticks her head in a bucket of sand. <laughs> what? Boss, you bought an ostrich. I bought an ostrich? That's right. She just ate the headlights off your car. The headlights? How do you know? She had two Adam's apples, and they were going down fast. <laughs> It's all your fault, Rochester. You were with me when I went shopping for a turkey. Why did you let me buy an ostrich? I told you it was a pretty big bird for the money, but you know you. <laughs> well, 
I guess there's nothing we can do about it now. Isn't that awful? I got a polar bear in the guest room and an ostrich in the garage. And mine's in the pantry. Let's move out. <laughs> now, don't get panicky, Rochester. I'll be home in a few minutes. Meanwhile, call up the market and order a turkey. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. What? Have you changed your mind about using my twin brother Thursday night? No, I haven't. Well, I'll, I'll figure out something. Goodbye. Wait a minute. Rochester. Rochester. Well, I'll be darned. What's the matter, Jack? Plenty. That big turkey I bought turned out to be an ostrich. Oh, boy. You're going to be lonesome on Thanksgiving. I am not. Now, Mary, don't worry. We're going to have a swell dinner. Play, Phil. I wonder if you can eat an ostrich. I Some folks are celebrating Thanksgiving on the 23rd of the month, others on the 30th. Well, either way, I'd like to offer a suggestion in regard to your holiday menu. For dinner, of course, there'll be plum pudding or pumpkin pie, but later on in the evening, when supper time comes, bring the day's feasting to a fitting close with a truly out of the ordinary dessert a shimmering dish of golden lemon jello. Now, there's really a luscious looking dessert, ladies and gentlemen. A grand treat full of the ripe, tingling flavor of juicy lemons fresh from the tree and glowing with the warm color of sunshine. And you can serve it in shapely molds garnished with fruit, nuts, and maraschino cherries. Or it can be sliced into dainty cubes, tumbled into parfait glasses, and topped with snowy whipped cream. Either way, it adds up to a mighty slick dessert that will catch every eye and capture every taste. And that goes for all the rest of Jell-O's six delicious flavors. Strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. Jell-O, remember, is a light dessert. Just the thing to appeal after a heavy midday meal. And it's quick and easy to make with, and mother will appreciate it. After working, uh, cooking a big Thanksgiving dinner. So order genuine Jell-O from your grocer tomorrow. program in the current Jell-O series, and we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Now, don't forget, Mary, next Thursday night at my house for a real Thanksgiving dinner. Count me out, Jack. Now, wait a minute. I'm not going to serve that ostrich. I'm going to have a turkey. Oh, you are, eh? Yes. Well, if I find a headlight in the dressing, watch out. Oh, don't worry. Good night, folks, and a happy Thanksgiving. Here's news. Every Tuesday night, the Aldrich family is on the air, starring Ezra Stone as Henry Aldrich, that lovable hard luck kid. Consult your local newspaper or radio guide for time and stations, and be sure to tune in on the Aldrich family next Tuesday night. Bluebirds in the Moonlight is from Gulliver's Travels. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Great Gildersleeve was always good for a holiday episode filled with contemporary references. This time it's November of 1942, so we're almost one year into World War II. There's lots of limits on what's available, and rationing is in effect, particularly gasoline rationing. Most people got an A, B, or C rating, depending on how you needed gasoline. Not just how much you wanted, but how much you needed. You had a sticker on your car, clearly identifying it, A, B, or C. But you also had a book of stamps, which your gas station attendant would clip off as you used them. And he would enforce, oh, sorry, only one a week, only two a week, whatever. Nearly everybody got an A, which meant you could buy four gallons of gasoline a week. B users got twice that. Usually you had to be in military work for that. Uh, C stickers, even harder to get, were granted to people deemed very essential to the war effort. There was a subsection T for people driving actual trucks. And then there was the X sticker, Unlimited Purchase. Members of the clergy, police, firemen, civil defense workers got these. People who had to drive a lot and who could not be delayed due to lack of gasoline. There is reference to Donald Nelson. Donald M. Nelson was a business executive from Sears Roebuck. 
at the time one of the world's largest companies, who joined the U.S. government in 1941 as head of the United States War Production Board. The idea was that as an executive used to managing large amounts of products and moving them around, he would be able to run the massive purchasing and distribution system that the United States required in order to fight in World War II, allocating resources, distributing personnel. In other words, he was a highly efficient man who got things done. A good role model for Gildy, who likes to think he's a highly efficient man who gets things done. One thing not mentioned in this story is something that Gildy would not want to emulate from Donald Nelson, and that's his salary. Nelson was a dollar-a-year man. Great term. These were usually very successful and rich people who had gone to work for the government. They had very specific skills which the government needed. They didn't need the lowly government salary that would have been due to them, so they essentially volunteered their efforts for the, the national good. Well, the U.S. government doesn't allow you to do that for nothing. You have to have some sort of payment, even if it's only a dollar a year. So that's what Nelson and a bunch of other corporate executives did. I understand some people still do this. I think Arnold Schwarzenegger and Mitt Romney both received as near to zero as possible in formal pay when they served as governors. Do school kids still study the 1858 poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, The Courtship of Miles Standish? I don't know. It used to be a standard, though, a regular. It's all about the Mayflower Pilgrims and the Massachusetts Plymouth Colony in the 1600s. We get a lot of our ideas about the Pilgrims and how they spoke from that poem. Um, it's essentially the love triangle between Miles Standish, Priscilla Mullins, and John Alden. All real people. Uh, supposedly, Standish, the colony's military leader, was too shy to propose to Priscilla, so he asked his good buddy John Alden to do it on his behalf, only to have Priscilla ask famously, Why don't you speak for yourself, John? For she knew John was in love with her also. And so he did, and so John and Priscilla were married. Longfellow was apparently a direct descendant of John and Priscilla, so he had a family stake in this poem. A blunderbuss is a form of gun. It's the old-fashioned one that loads down the muzzle. Uh, you put down the propellant, you put down some projectiles, bullets if you've got them, could be shot, rocks. You know, basically picture any gun from the Pilgrim's time to the Revolutionary War, and yep, that's a blunderbuss. The name is a corruption of thunder uh, due to the very loud noise and sometimes bright fire of the muzzle blast. From November 22nd, 1942, The Great Gildersleeve, Thanksgiving Dinner. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> yeah. Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton. We'll hear from The Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. You know, these days it's pretty difficult to get the variety of foods you used to get. And that's why you should make the plentiful foods you can get as appetizing as possible. Now, one easy economical way to make foods taste better is to use delicious parquet margarine at the table and for cooking, too. First of all, of course, parquet margarine is a perfectly delicious spread for bread or toast or rolls. And next, parquet margarine is a tasty seasoning for potatoes and all hot vegetables. Parquet margarine makes cookies and pastries taste better, too, because it's a real flavor shortening, not bland and tasteless as some shortenings are. And lastly, you'll find parquet adds tempting extra flavor to pan-fried foods. Yes, you can make everyday foods taste better when you use parquet. Remember, too, it's a nourishing energy food that contains vitamin A. So ask your dealer tomorrow for wholesome, economical parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Well, let's get on to the great Gildersleeve, who's been putting in a busy Saturday morning down at the water department, trying to clear his desk of all the odds and ends that have piled up there. As we join him now, we find him almost down to the blotter and feeling pretty good about it. Action, yes, action. That's the keynote today, Miss Fitch. And you have accomplished a great deal this morning, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yes, sir. Never put off till tomorrow what you can do today. I try not to. 
Uh, Procrastination is the thief of time. Uh, There's a letter here. Time and tide wait for no man. This woman wrote in two weeks ago. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost, Miss Fitch. Action, that's the thing, action. (laughs) Mr. Gildersleeve, are you going to answer this woman's letter? What does she want? Action. Be (laughs) sure. Well, uh, let's see the letter. She says she wrote in two weeks ago and never got an answer. Oh, oh, yes, I remember this. Uh, Take an answer. Very well. Uh, Dear Madam... In reply to your recent letter regarding a kneel in your bathtub, <laughs> we wish to thank you for calling this to our attention. After a thorough investigation of the matter, we wish to report that it would have been impossible for the said eel to have gained access to your tub through the faucet. As all our water is carefully filtered, and furthermore, standard plumbing fixtures are too small to accommodate a kneel of the dimensions you describe. <laughs> We can only suggest that the creature either crawled up the drain, in which event your attorney should get in touch with the Department of Public Works, not us. Or possibly it was placed in your tub by an enemy. While it's out of our department, we'd suggest that a stopper kept in the tub at all times should prove an effective precaution against eels in the future. (laughs) Failing which, we'd advise a closer check on your friends. Very truly yours, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, Water Commissioner. You got that? Yes, Mr. Gildersleeve. That ought to hold her. What's next? Well, I don't know whether you want to do anything about this. Let's have it. Action, Miss Fitch. Let's clear the decks here. Uh, Very well. This is no time for bottlenecks. Uh, No. Uh, You'll notice that in every photograph of Donald Nelson, (laughs) there's not a single paper on Donald Nelson's desk. That's the only way to be an executive. Do it now. Strike while the iron is hot. Come, come, come. What have you got there? A six-month reminder from your dentist. You. <laughs> well, suppose you put that in the deferred file. That's where it came from. <laughs> You're a hard woman, Miss Fitch. <laughs> All right, call up the dentist and make an appointment for Monday. Good. For Leroy. <laughs> Come on, let's get on here. Time's a wasting. Hey, have you got the application for my B gas ration? Yes, it's right here. Oh, I must remember to get that in this afternoon. It's all filled out. All you have to do is sign it. I better check it over. Let's see here. It says, uh, occupational use of the vehicle. If vehicle is used for driving between home and fixed place of work, in the principal occupation as stated in items four and six above, answer all questions in part A below. (laughs) If vehicle is used in the performance of the principal occupation stated in items four and six above, Oh, brother, I'll take your word for it, Miss Fitch. <laughs> oh, uh, you also have to get the signatures of any person sharing the ride with you. Oh, well, Judge Hooker is my share of the rider, but he isn't speaking to me. He can darn well sign, though. I understand very few people are going to get the B rations. Oh, I'll get one, all right. After all, I'm a city official. I have to do a lot of official driving. I'm entitled to one if anybody is. Yes, but uh, have you heard who's head of the ration board now? It, it doesn't make any difference. Who? Judge Hooker. Ooh, Judge Hooker. <laughs> oh, my goodness. If Hooker will find some technicality. He'll block it if he has to stage a filibuster. Maybe I'd better invite the old goat to Thanksgiving dinner after all. That might soften him up a little. Yes, certainly. Mm-hmm. He couldn't accept a man's hospitality and then trick him out of his B card, could he? <laughs> I don't recall that the application form covers that. No, I didn't think so. <laughs> Quiet. Here comes the old sour ball now. Well, hello there, Judge. <laughs> When does the bus leave, Gildersleeve? Uh, the bus leaves whenever you're ready, Judgey. I'm ready now. Be right with you. Can't keep a customer waiting, can we, Miss Fitch? I'll get my hat and coat. Mr. Gildersleeve, uh, you're not forgetting. Forget uh... you. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, while you're waiting, Judge, Miss Fitch has an application blank there that requires your signature. Uh, a mere formality, you know. What's this? Uh, just to show that I'm sharing my car with you. Oh, so you're applying for a B-ration book, huh? Aren't we all? (laughs) (laughs) Give the judge a pen, Miss Fitch. Here, oh, use mine. It's a self-filler. I think you'll like it. There, that's it. There you are. Thank you, Judge. Well, see you Monday, Miss Fitch. Oh, uh, by the way, Horace, I meant to ask you before. I hope you'll give us the pleasure of dining with us as usual on Thursday. Mm, I thought you'd forgotten all about Thanksgiving. Not at all. Thanksgiving wouldn't be Thanksgiving without you, Horace. (laughs) You know that. Leroy, now while I fit this, I feel like a sissy in this fool outfit. This is the kind of clothes the pilgrims wore, and they were no sissies. Yeah, but they didn't have to wear them in front of a whole auditorium full of people. 
Stand still, will you, before I jab you with this pin. Courtship of Miles Standish. Why don't you speak for yourself, John? Yeah. Oh! I told you you'd get stuck. You know, <laughs> I think you're going to look real cute when I get this down. That's just what I'm afraid of. That's what the whole school is going to think. Leroy, will you stand still? It wouldn't have been so bad if I was Miles Standish. I'd get to wear a helmet. But John Alden, that panty waist. I'm lucky the teacher didn't make me play Priscilla. <laughs> I don't see why you feel that way. John Alden is a hero. Remember, it's John Alden who gets the girl. Yeah, Ethel Hammerschlag, he can have her. <laughs> And Leroy. Hello. Well, look at our little pilgrim. Hey, Marge, can't I take this off now? No, wait till I get it pinned. You know your lines yet, young man? Some of them. Well, it's about time. You've been rehearsing that part for a month. I've been trying to get out of it for a month. That's no attitude to take. The courtship of Miles Standish is great literature. I studied it in school myself. I remember it to this very day. Uh, this is the forest primeval, the murmuring pines and the hills. <laughs> Evangeline, Uncle Mort. Ev well, that's good, too. <laughs> if, let's hear you recite that speech you were having trouble with last night, Leroy. No, I don't want to. Come on now, I want to see if you've learned it. Oh, some other time, Uncle. No, right now. I'd like to hear it. We both would. Wouldn't we, Marjorie? We'd love to. No, I won't do it. Not if she's going to listen. Young man, you'll recite that speech or you'll go right upstairs to your room. Okay. <laughs> we're waiting. <laughs> let's see. Uh, um... Pretty Mistress Priscilla, turn out a deaf ear to the suit of one who, though absent yet, uh, yet, uh... Yet loves thee with a noble and undying passion. Go back and try it again. Do I have to? Yes. If you don't keep at it, you'll never learn the part. If I don't learn the part, maybe we won't have to do it. <laughs> you'll do it, or I'll know the reason why. Come on now, once more. Pretty Mistress Priscilla... Pretty Mistress... I can't say it. You're not trying. <laughs> Pretty Mistress Priscilla... <laughs> How you got me doing it? Excuse me. Oh, Bertie, I want to talk to you. Leroy, you go up to your room and practice. Darn old Miles Standish, anyway. Uh, quiet, you. <laughs> Bertie, I've invited Judge Hooker to Thanksgiving dinner. So that'll mean one more. That'll mean five more. If what? Yes, I hope you don't mind, Uncle Mort. I invited four of the boys from Camp Fuller. Oh, well, fine. The more, the merrier. Thanksgiving isn't Thanksgiving unless there are plenty around to enjoy the turkey. Uh, speaking of turkey, Mr. Gilsley. Uh, yes, Bertie? You wouldn't want to buy a chance on one, would you, I don't suppose? Uh, what do you mean, Bertie? Well, the ladies at my church is holding the turkey raffle. Again? If All right, I'll buy a chance. How much are they? Twenty-five cents. That's for one. One chance. There you are. There's a quarter. Thank you. Most everybody around here has bought one from me. All the neighbors. Well, you're doing fine. Of course. If you used to buy two chances. It stands to reason you'd have twice as good a chance as they have. Yeah. <laughs> no getting around that, Bertie. All right, I'll take two. Mr. Gillsleeve, you're making no mistake. Turkey's awful expensive this year. Yes, I know, Bertie. Forty-eight cents a pound a day one grocery. Oh, brother. Yeah. <laughs> So if even you used to buy three chances, you'd still be ahead. <laughs> Sold, Bertie. Make it three. Yes, sir. Let's see now. How many is it going to be for dinner? Well, there's Marjorie and Leroy and Judge Hooker and Mrs. Ransom and the four soldiers. And you, Bertie, that makes nine. And you, that makes twelve. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, ask me. That's going to take a big turkey. Well, maybe we should order one right away and ask him to hold it for us. Well, let's wait and see how this raffle comes out first, Marjorie. We don't want to be stuck with two turkeys, you know. Of course, they've sold quite a lot of chances on it, and you've only got three. Uh, Bertie, if you can guarantee I'll get the turkey, I'll take five chances. Well, I can't promise nothing, but my cousin's doing the drawing. <laughs> I'll take five. Well, that'd be a dollar and a quarter. That's right. Well, here's another dollar. That's quite a lot of money. Yes, it is. A dollar and a quarter will buy a lot of things. Don't I know it. You wouldn't like to take a couple more chances just to protect your investment. <laughs> you get out of here, Bertie, before you ruin me. I got to get down to the ration board. <laughs> Look at that crowd. Yes. It, pardon me. It, could somebody tell me whether this is where you get B ration books? No, this is where you don't get them. <laughs> yeah, wise guy. 
Uh, madam, would you mind? You can't shove in here. I'm not trying to shove in. Uh, end of the line. End of the line. <laughs> I've been waiting here since two o'clock, and you come trying to shove in. Yeah. Madam, I was merely trying to ask a civil question. Uh, end of the line, yes. Bert. Just a minute. Who do you think you're pushing? Well, who do you think you're pushing? Well, who do you think you're pushing? <laughs> Why, George, if you weren't wearing glasses. Well, I'll take them off. There. You look worse. Put them back on. <laughs> What's the fuss here? What's the fuss? He tried to shove in ahead of me. I did not. He did too, and he squeezed my hand. Oh! <laughs> now look here, my good woman. We'll have to ask for order here, my friend. Why don't you just take your place in the line? I'm trying to find out whether this is the right line. I've come for my B ration book. Oh, you've come for it, huh? Yes. I have my application right here. Uh, you and a hundred million others. What? <laughs> Young man, evidently you don't know who I am. I happen to be Throckmorton P. Gillisleeve, and I have to do a lot of driving. Where to? Well, out to the reservoir. To the reservoir? What for? To see if there's anything in it. Yeah? <laughs> Listen, brother, if we gave a ration book to everybody who wants to drive out to the reservoir for a little necking in the moonlight... I don't do any necking in the moonlight. Oh, you like it in the dark? Yeah. No! <laughs> And I didn't come here to be insulted by underlings. End of the line, bud. Yes, end of the line. End of the line. End of the line. Oh, shut up. <laughs> oh, Judge, I want you to tell this young whippersnapper here where I get where he gets off. Well, now, Gildy. He has the nerve to tell me I'm not entitled to a B ration book. Well, he may be right, Gildy. You're only sharing the ride with one person. You can't throw those technicalities at me, Hooker. You're the share of my rider. You signed this application yourself. I know that, Gildy. As a share of the rider, I'd be delighted to see you get your ration book. But as a ration official, I couldn't possibly pass this application. My conscience wouldn't allow it. All right, Judge. As a ration official, you needn't bother to come to Thanksgiving dinner. And as a share of the rider, from now on, you can walk. And the line. Oh, you can have your own line. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few seconds. If you're troubled with a food budget that's hard to keep in line these days, just remember this. There are any number of wholesome, good-tasting, nutritious foods that can help you keep your food budget down. Now, one such food, surely, is parquet margarine, Kraft's delicious spread for bread, because it's good-tasting, economical, and nutritious. Parquet margarine's flavor is something pretty special. Thousands know it as the margarine that tastes so deliciously good. And just as important, parquet margarine is an economical source of food elements that your family needs. Yes, wholesome, nourishing parquet margarine is one of the best energy foods you can serve. And year-round, every pound of parquet contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. Yes, it's wise to economize with parquet margarine. It's delicious, nutritious, and thrifty. So buy parquet margarine tomorrow. Just ask your food dealer... For Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet, the margarine that's made by Kraft. Now back to Summerfield of the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Apparently, he'll get no more gas than the rest of us, but uh, what about turkey? It's Tuesday afternoon now, only two days before Thanksgiving. We find our hero checking last-minute details with Marjorie. What about those four soldiers, my dear? Are you sure they're coming? Oh, yes. I had a note this morning from their commanding officer. They'll arrive at 12 o'clock sharp in a jeep. A jeep? Mm -hmm. Oh, brother, what an appetite they'll have. <laughs> I'll have to run around the house a couple of times to get myself up to concert pitch. Can't let the boys show me up at my own table. I don't think you need to worry about that, Uncle Mort. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess we're all set. Soldiers accepted. Hooker canceled. Mrs. Ransom. Uh, Mrs. Ransom's coming, isn't she? Well, you invited her, didn't you? No, I thought you'd take care of that. You're the lady of the house. Oh, but I thought you'd want to. Oh, dear. And I went over there this morning to borrow a roasting pan for the turkey and never said a word about it. Uh, what, must, what must she think? Oh, this is terrible. This is awful. I'll run over there right now. Sir was right. She's made other plans. A fine thing. Borrow a woman's roaster and then not invite her to dinner. Oh, my goodness. Mr. Gildersleeve. Eh, uh, Leela, I've come to explain. I don't know what there is to explain, I'm sure. Uh, may I come in? Well, I'm rather busy. Uh, just for a moment. Well. 
Leela, of course you're coming to Thanksgiving dinner Thursday. Well, I'm hardly in the habit of going to places to which I've not been invited, Mr. Gildersleeve. But you are invited. You've been invited all along. There was a mix-up, that's all. I thought Marjorie had asked you, and Marjorie thought I had. How do I know? How do I know you're not just inviting me for my roasting pan? <laughs> Lilo, when I thought of inviting you, nothing was further from my mind than a roasting pan. Oh, you say those things, but you don't mean them. It's the truth. You were the first one on my list, Leela. Was I, Throckmorton? Sure enough. Yeah, sure enough. <laughs> Oh, but I'm afraid I couldn't accept it this late date. You see, I've had all these other invitations. Oh. If I turn them down now, I know they'd be heartbroken, much as I'd like to have dinner with you. We're having a 20-pound turkey. Well, I love turkey, but I'm afraid I can't. I'll save you the white meat. No, don't tempt me now. I'll save you the wishbone. We can make a wish on it. What would you wish, Throckmorton? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not supposed to tell you. Well, I don't know that I could trust you with a wishbone. And, <laughs> and anyway, I've promised these other people. But you've got to come, Leela. Marjorie and Leroy will be terribly disappointed if you don't. And so will I. So will Bertie. If so will the Army. The Army? Yes, we're having four young lieutenants to dinner, too. Throckmorton, why in the world didn't you say so? You mean you'll come? Will I? You're too good to me, Leela. <laughs> She's coming with bells on. I wouldn't put it past her. Huh? Uncle Mort, can I borrow your shotgun? No, Leroy, certainly not. Why? I'm supposed to bring a gun to school tomorrow. What kind of a school are they running? A reform school? <laughs> no, Miles Standish has got to have a blunderbuss. A blunderbuss. Here's your pilgrim suit, Leroy. I pressed the collar, so don't mess it up. Oh, put it on, Leroy, and show Uncle Mort how nice it looks. Not finished. Oh, no. Go ahead. You look real nice in it. I look like a sissy in it. You look better than you do in that Mickey Mouse sweatshirt you wear all the time. Yeah, and cleaner, too. <laughs> put on the pilgrim suit, Leroy. Oh, uh, Your sister worked hard on it. Won't do you any harm to put it on once. Go ahead. Okay. I'd like to meet that guy Longfellow. Yeah. <laughs> well, Bertie, you think we're going to have enough turkey for all these people Thursday? I don't know, Mr. Gilsley. Let's see now. We've got four soldiers, and the four of us here, and Mrs. Ransom. What about Judge Hooker? Judge Hooker is an ungrateful old goat. Never mention his name in this house. Excuse me. I didn't know it was like that again. <laughs> There'll be eight of us at dinner. And you know the way soldiers eat. You think we ought to figure on two turkeys? I don't know, Mr. Gillsleeve. I don't know what we ought to do. What's the matter, Bertie? You seem to be sort of dragging today. <coughs> I don't know. I don't guess I feel so good. Out a little late last night? No, sir. No later than usual. I just got a feeling, that's all. What kind of a feeling? Like things wasn't going to work out somehow. Oh, well, don't let it get you down. Uh, by the way, when are they going to raffle off that turkey I bought all those chances on? Yes, we can't wait much longer to find out about that. Thanksgiving's only two days off. I was thinking, Mr. Gillsleeve, how would it be if we had a nice ham instead of a turkey? <laughs> Bertie, are you hiding something from us? No, sir, I ain't hiding nothing. Except they had that raffle last night. Oh. You came close, Mr. Gillsleeve. You came mighty close. The winning number was 61, and you had 62. <laughs> but it still leaves us without a turkey. Well, sort of. Oh, well, if you gamble, you have to expect those things. Well, we better order a turkey right away, though. Yes, we can't invite all those soldiers to come 20 miles for Thanksgiving dinner and have no Thanksgiving dinner. Well, I'll go call up the market and reserve one. That's just a trouble. What do you mean? I called up the market, and all the turkeys is reserved. You mean they won't sell us one? Butcher says there ain't a turkey left in Summerfield. I don't know what's the matter. Last week, no pot roast. This week, no turkey. <laughs> We've got to have a turkey. We've invited all these soldiers. We've invited Mrs. Ransom. We've got to find one. But where? Don't ask me. All right, Unc. How do you like it? Like what? The pilgrim suit. Oh, forget the pilgrim suit. We've just lost our turkey. <laughs> no turkey? No turkey. How do you like that? Well, it looks like we'll all wind up eating turkey sandwiches at the drugstore. Yeah. Some Thanksgiving. The drugstore. Maybe Peavy's got a turkey. Hold everything, kids. I'll be right back. I'm going to the drugstore. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, Peavy. 
Peavy, you've got to help me out. Well, I'm always glad to do customer service. Good. Have you got a turkey? Uh, what was that again? Have you got a turkey? A turkey? Well, now, I've had people come in here and ask for some strange things, but this is the first time I've ever had a request for a turkey. It is, but never mind that. Have you got one? Uh, no, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, turkeys are one thing that I don't carry. I'm sorry. Uh, have you tried the meat market? <laughs> Of course I've tried the meat market. Why do you think I came in here? I wondered. It... <laughs> now, just a minute, Peavy. You serve turkey sandwiches at your soda fountain, don't you? Yes, we do serve a turkey sandwich. You can't make a turkey sandwich without a turkey, can you? Well, now, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> In other words, P.V., your turkey sandwich is not a turkey sandwich. Well, turkey sandwich has become a sort of a trade expression, although we serve it with genuine cranberry jelly on the side. Yeah. <laughs> but suppose you don't care for cranberry jelly. Well, then you just ask for the regular chicken sandwich. Yes, sir. P.V., I'm surprised at you. I don't know how you can sleep nights. Well, I did used to have a little trouble, but... I just take a cup of hot cocoa before going to bed now, and I find that sets me right. So does Mrs. Peavy. <laughs> well, this isn't finding a turkey. i got to get going. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Gildersleeve. Have a nice Thanksgiving. And same to you. Don't drink too much cocoa, and don't let Mrs. Peavy. <laughs> Uh, not a bit, my dear. I've been everywhere. It's no use. The army's picked the place clean. There's not a single turkey left. Maybe I should warn those boys at camp. They'll do better if they stay there. Yes. Wait. There's just one chance left. What's that? If we can find out who won the turkey in Bertie's raffle, we might be able to buy it from him. Yes, Bertie! Yes, Mr. Gilsley? Uh, would you mind coming in here? Yes, sir. Bertie, do you know who won that turkey in your raffle? Uh, no, sir. Hmm. Do you think you could find out? Well, sir, I might be able to, and then again I might not. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, if I still find out who won, you might not like it. Come clean, Bertie. What bush are you beating about now? Do you know who won the turkey? Uh, yes. Well, why didn't you say so? Who is it? Well, you said never to mention Judge Hooker's name. Oh! <laughs> Like it. Well, there goes our only chance. Uncle Moore, don't you think Judge Hooker would be willing to let you have it? After what I told him down at the ration board? No, my dear, I really gave him a piece of my mind there. But if you took it all back and invited him to dinner again... When he's got the turkey, he'd just laugh at me. He'd... he'd... Uh, wait a minute. Uh, Bertie! Yeah? Does Judge Hooker know yet that he's won the turkey? No, sir, I'm supposed to deliver it to him this evening. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Excuse me, folks. I got to see a judge about a bird. <laughs> Horace, I've come to ask your forgiveness. Yeah, you've come to the wrong place, Gildersleeve. That's a cruel attitude, Judge, but I don't blame you for taking it. You behave like a boor, Gildersleeve. You're right. A big boor. In front of a whole lot of people, too. Yeah. I could kick myself when I think of it. Well, we all fly off the handle sometimes. There was no excuse for it, doing a thing like that to my old friend. Well, guilty of... Horace, you may think me a sentimental old fool, but we've been pals for a good many years now, haven't we? Uh, off and on. <laughs> yes, guilty, we have. Yeah. Off and on. If... <laughs> and we've always had Thanksgiving dinner together, haven't we? Yeah, I guess that's right. Well... I want you to have it with us again this year. You really mean that? Horace, I've said it before, and I mean it now more than ever. If you don't come to Thanksgiving dinner, it just won't be Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> well, then, I'll certainly be delighted to come. Good. Don't forget now. I won't. We'll be counting on you. I'll be there. What time would you like to have me come? Oh, come early, Judge. Uh, come about 9 o'clock in the morning. 9 o'clock? Yeah. And when you come, would you mind bringing that turkey you won in the raffle, Judge?
I've got to be going. But it's been a mighty pleasant day. Oh, stick around, Judge. The evening's young yet. No, I've got to get an early start in the morning. But I don't know when I've had a finer Thanksgiving. Well, it was your turkey, Judge. Well, I share my turkey, you share your car. That's the spirit today. Yeah, and the good spirit, too. It brings people together, Judge. Yes, it does, Gildy. I'm sorry we had that misunderstanding down at the ration board. As a matter of fact, you're probably entitled to a B ration. You use your car for official business. Well, I don't want a B book. What? No, I've been thinking about it, Horace. It seems to me the spirit of rationing is to get along with as little as you can, instead of grabbing all you can get. You're absolutely right, Gildy. And I'm glad to hear you say it. You're a credit to the community. Well, thank you, Horace. And you may rest assured that even though I only, I've only a humble A ration, my car will still be at your service at all times. You mean that, Gildy? I do, indeed. That's fine. I've got to meet a train at Moore's Junction at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. Good night, Gildy. Yeah. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by Billy Mills. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to tune in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Ladies, when you want to make good macaroni and cheese, get a package of Kraft Dinner. This wonderful product is really an answer to a housewife's prayer for an easy and quick-to-make main dish. It takes only seven minutes cooking time to fix delicious macaroni and cheese with Kraft Dinner. Put the macaroni that's in the package into boiling water and cook rapidly for seven minutes. In just that short time, you have fluffy, tender macaroni all ready for the cheese goodness. So you take the package of Kraft Grated, which comes with Kraft Dinner, and sprinkle it on the macaroni stirring the delicious cheese flavor through and through. That's all there is to it. Your macaroni and cheese is ready to be served. And once you've prepared it this way, you'll never want to go back to the old-fashioned way of baking it. Not when Kraft Dinner gives you such tempting macaroni and cheese in just seven minutes. Why not try it tomorrow? Just ask your dealer for a package of Kraft Dinner. It's so convenient, so economical, and so good. This program reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. That's your old-time radio fix for this week. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. Be sure to subscribe to The Chronic Rift on iTunes or visit us frequently at chronicrift.com. What a voice. What a voice. Simply means ink. I think you do. I think you do. Good night, folks. Signing off. Golly, why can't I act right outside of a baseball game? Marcy, maybe you can go to old Chuck and patch things up for me. Maybe you can tell him how I really feel. Tell him that I didn't mean it the way it sounded. Marcy, you can do it. You go see him and tell him that I really like him and that the dinner is okay with me. Well, I don't know, but I'll try. I think maybe you should go to Chuck and tell him yourself. No, Marcy, I'll just ruin everything. You know I'm too brusque and rough. You go and speak for me. Well, okay. This is not unlike another famous Thanksgiving episode. Do you remember the story of John Alden? and Priscilla Mullins, and Captain Miles Standish? This isn't like that one at all.